Welcome <laughs> to the Tone Shapes and Colors Masters series organized by uh, New York Jazz Workshop. Um, it's great to see you all here. This uh, series is uh, specifically for, for uh, uh, students and music enthusiasts, uh, uh, semi-professional, professional, uh, uh, beginners, intermediate. Uh, it's uh, our way, way from the New York Jazz Workshop to offer some uh, knowledge and inspiration. Um, this particular master class is about a very specific topic. We're going to talk about uh, 12 tone uh, uh, theories and uh, how to apply that in a musical context, specifically in composition and improvisation. Now, when we talk about uh, 12 tone uh, systems and theories, uh, uh, we a lot of times associated with grammaticism. And uh, I get a lot of students coming to me saying, what is grammaticism, how do you approach it, and what is, you know, and the 12 tone idea is out there, everybody knows about it, but not many people really know the, the content of this principle. Well, grammaticism was there really from the beginning on. Uh, if you look at the jazz history, and you go, uh, you know, you look at the blues scale, you got grammaticism right there. You look at the bebop scales, uh, that's chromaticism. You look at uh, tension notes, all that kind of stuff, chromaticism. You look at uh, harmonic superimpositions, is uh, harmonic chromaticism. You look at polychordal systems, is chromaticism. So it's everywhere. So 12 tone is not the only principle that deals with uh, chromaticism. Um, it's everywhere in all music forms and really from the beginning on. Um, having said that, um, I had the fortune uh, to have a great conversation with John uh, at the Jazz uh, Standard. We were, we were at the, the same gig together and he started laying it out for me. And I was so inspired, it was so great. And uh, the first thing that struck me is, first of all, that I got to practice. <laughs> <laughs> but the second thing also, it was such a pity that not more people were there to witness this conversation. Because it was really significant. I found it very profound, very significant. And uh, with that in mind, I contacted uh, Marco and uh, set up this, this particular masterclass. Now, uh, another thing that is also very interesting is that when I look at my bookshelf, there are two books of advanced music that I regard uh, on the highest, highest standard. And these are two of my most favorite books that I really studied from the cover to the back, which I cannot say of many of the books that are next to my nightstand and you know, that are still waiting. And uh, one book is uh, from Lumila Yulela, which deals with uh, Romanticism to the Twelve Tone Row, uh, which is published by Advanced Music. And another great book is uh, Dave Liebman, who wrote a great book on Romanticism in Jazz, uh, Harmony and Melody, also published by Advanced Music. Uh, I'm now very happy to announce that there's a third one that should be in a row, which is uh, the concept written by Mr. O'Gallagher. So please give him a welcome applause. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the first thing that struck me with, with the book, uh, you gave me uh, a sample, so I immediately started to get into it. And uh, the first thing that struck me was the... the how beautifully the theory is, is, is composed theoretically. I really thought it was like a haiku poem or something, when I see how these rows are put together and, and how they are balanced and how they shape and the consistency with the shapes, uh, uh, how that all, all, uh, all works together. That was the first thing. And then, uh, that, uh, well, of course I read it first before I started even daring to get to my horn. And then I started to get on my horn with that stuff, and, and I was again really struck with how fast you come with fresh new ideas that are almost the same, but totally different from what you play. And it blew me away. It's not that you have to go through the book halfway through. It's pretty much when you start with the one plus two uh, little, little uh, cells that you already start to get, get the feel of, wow. This is quite amazing. Now, my first question, before we get more into that. 
how did you get into this kind of uh, uh, theory? Was it that you woke up one day and said, oh, no, I have to buy some bread, I have to do the laundry, and I've got to figure out this 12 thing, <laughs> and then I've got to pick up my life, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it was exactly like that. It was exactly like that. Yeah, I see no. that um, No, the, the funny thing is that I've been interested in, in modern classical music for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, going back to my, my earliest saxophone teacher, mm -hmm. you know, we would study um, classical saxophone literature and, you know, get into like, you know, all the, you know, repertoire and most, a lot of that is 20th century, mm -hmm. most of it is 20th century music and deals with a lot of chromaticism and stuff. So I've always been very interested in that music and a big fan of, you know, Schoenberg and Weber and then curious about it. And so I would do, you know, just research as I, you know, I know you've done, you just like search out all the books you can find dealing with, you know, topics of, of chromaticism, topics about 12 tone composition, because there's not anything, better, well, there's starting to become more uh, stuff you can find dealing with jazz and that, mm -hmm. but, but really that's only happened within the last like 10 years. I mean, you know, there wasn't that much material like in the 90s you could find right. other than classical, um, you know, kind of books dealing on analysis of Schoenberg. I mean, there was great books by George Pearl. Um, there's a um, great book by Charles Wernin, but they all deal with composition, mm -hmm. and it's all compositional right. kind of tools. And, you know, then trying to read, you know, Milton Babbitt's writings and, and trying to understand where these guys are coming from. And then, you know, uh, um, a great, uh, you know, understood a lot of what was trying to write a lot of um, music based on that. But, you know, stumbled on a book by Peter Schatt, which actually was the first book that kind of codified it. it. It never really was that clear to me how to use it in jazz, except when I came across his book, because it was really the kind of thing was like everything clicked that I had known before, now that I, I saw the way that he presented the idea of presenting 12-tone rows, each one being a um, uh, basically having its own chromatic palette, so you have 12 chromatic regions that are, you know, similar, you can think of in terms of, of them being akin to, you know, uh, the next set of symmetric scales after whole tone and after you right. you know, so, and so, I, you know, found that book and that kind of the light went on and, and reading, there were several other books on modern, you know, harmony that I've got and, and you know, I've been writing out exercises and trying to organize it in a way that, that made sense to me because as improvisers, we are really utilitarian. We tend to think in terms of like, you know, objects and we're playing and we're developing ideas and melody is an object that we deal with and we can, you know, build on it and stretch it and, and um, so, you know, I started writing these exercises and things and, um, and then slowly that's the genesis of the book and, you know, it was really for my own use to try and develop these things and then I realized maybe other people might be interested in it right. because it took a lot of different sources for me to find, you know, right. to find this material. So, you know, it's kind of a, I'm trying making it easier for other people to not have to wade through all that material. You definitely have, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, you know, uh, in the book you, you list also all the, uh, the books that, that inspired you. Right. Which is great. So please, if you, if you get the book, you, you will know not only what, what, uh, what he concluded out of that Material, but also where inspiration comes from, which I think is so important because, like that book that you mentioned, Peter Scott, right? This is a very important book, and uh, so is the Lubina book and all those. Absolutely, kind of, you know, and each books. one just feeds your imagination, and, and you know, you start to make connections between all this information, and and you know, um, I, I found that even you know, not totally understanding something, you know, that you're wading through, uh, it's worthwhile because at some point the light will go on. And, right. and you might get a piece of information from another source that makes sense and then makes the other thing kind of click for right. you. So, you know, I, I would just force myself to read, you know, all these books. And if I didn't understand all of it, right. that was okay. I would, right. you know, because very often they're very analytical. A lot of them deal with mathematics. And, you know, I don't even balance my checkbook. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Plus, like, then you get the piano jobs <laughs> also to deal with. You know. Right, no, no. Exactly. So the math, a lot of times with these right. theorists, you know, a lot of the, the heavy theorists were, right. were originally mathematicians, right. you know, um, and so that's where that comes from. And so right. That can be very off-putting to jazz musicians who are really kind of, it's a more earthy thing, you know, right. it's an ear thing, it's like how does it feel, how does it sound, you know, we're not thinking, right. you know, that way.
So I can be a little off, but, but. Uh, I would like to, to ask a question about it. Before before we do that, are there maybe five works uh, uh, to listen <coughs> to that, that were an inspiration to, to this work that, that you made? Of course, you were mentioning one piece of Waven, which I think was Opus 29. Or right, Opus 29, uh, and both of uh, and 31, mm -hmm. is, is, they're really great. What, what um, else for Opus 27 as well, right. so which, is, which is the piano uh, variations. It's the only piece of Vagrant Road that's for piano, mm -hmm. solo piano, which is unusual because you think like, you know, piano is basically the instrument that all composers are, you know, conversant with. That's mm -hmm. like, you know, and um, it's actually, it's fantastic, it's a great piece, and it deals with all the really advanced things about symmetry that Vagrant was into, and, you know, 12 tone rows, and, and how to manipulate. Um, you know, just their, their, and their beautiful pieces, right. which is really great. Are there any other composers you can uh, recommend? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love, I, I mean, one of my favorites, um, who is actually a product of the serial music, but I wouldn't really consider him strictly serial. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of terminology with when it comes to 20th century composition, right. composition because, you know, you say 12 tone, and immediately there's a preconception about, like, you know, uh, you know, of a certain period, and you can't repeat pitches, and then you know, right. serial. Well, then what does that mean? Is that twelve tone? And it, it becomes very confusing. It's very much like the terminology we have in jazz when you say, you know, bebop or mm -hmm. hard bop or mm -hmm. post bop or you know, fusion. Or what does right. what does it mean? Well, it yeah. means different things to different people depending on their preconceptions. Right. So, and and there are, I mean, you know, in strict twelve tone, there are some rules you have to follow. The same way there is in strict species counterpoint, like, you know, you've got species two, and species three, right. you've yeah. got to follow these rules, and, and that's true, but, you know, we're at this point, and it's important to know, but at this point in, you know, in music, composers don't necessarily, well, have they ever really follow the rules, right. you know, and they're breaking rules and finding ways to manipulate things, you know, so, but uh, other composers that I love, Ligeti is like, you know, or Ligeti, however you can mm -hmm. say it, is one of the my favorite. Right. You know, his piano uh, etudes are kind of probably the great, greatest piano pieces of the 20th century. I mean, they're yeah. amazing. You know, book yeah. one, two, and three are, they, they, people, only like a handful of people could ever play them until in you know, the last 10 years. You know, right. They're amazing. Right. And, uh, and, you know, uh, obviously I love Schoenberg, I love Webern is a big in influence on me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, you know, the other composers as well from, from the 50s, you know, I mean, Stockhausen is, I, I love, you know, um, some of his music, and some Zanakis I love, you know, so some of his, depends on the pieces, like I have obviously certain things that I love. Mm -hmm. One of my, my favorite composers is Pierre Boulez, you know, Howard Berpons is amazing. If you've ever heard the clarinet, um, uh, dialogues the, for solo clarinet and, and rec um, recorded clarinet, Wow, that stuff is amazing, you know. And for us, it's like it sounds to me like like something someone can improvise, you know. Right. It's like, you know, and which is and Elliot Carter. I mean, you know, right. so this goes on. Yeah, it goes on and on. Now, how about in in the, the jazz uh, scene? Would you recommend any composers in the jazz scene that that you think did a good adaptation or a good? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. There's a lot of. I mean, you know. My taste in music, you know, obviously I, I love, you know, a lot of color, a lot of chromaticism, mm -hmm. and a lot of, you know, although I love all music, but, mm -hmm. but um, those two things really resonate with me. And, you know, composers um, today, who, I mean, we were just talking about Miles. Right. You know, Zavaki, exactly. He's an amazing composer. Right. His music is fantastic. If you've never heard his records, they're yeah. well worth, yeah. you know, repeated listenings. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Gary Thomas's music, and, you know, going back to Steve Coleman, and right. those guys, and Vijay, and, and you know, Rudrash, I think he's doing really, some really great things rhythmically and you know, musically, and, um, and, you know, then there's other guys that are more subtle, you know, with that kind of thing. Russ Lawson, amazing right. pianist, yeah. you know, he, his, his thing is unlike anyone else's, you know, he's used chromaticism in the way that he constructs things, and he's heavily rooted in modern classical right. music. Right. Yes. you know, yeah. and it's funny because like you listen to Russ improvise free sounds like an Elliot Carter piece, right? You know, it does. I yeah. mean, I went to see Elliot Carter. Uh, there was a concert that that um, Pierre uh, Laurent Amar played at Carnegie mm -hmm. Hall, and Russ and I went, and he was playing uh, uh, a bunch of Elliot Carter pieces, mm -hmm. and then he was playing uh, the Ives Concord. And when the Elliot Carter pieces came, 
you know, I, I didn't know the pieces that he was playing, and it just sounded to me like, wow, that could just be Russ improvising, yeah. actually. I mean, it really is that, you know. Wow, it's fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, great. Yeah. Well, you, I hope you all made the notes. <laughs> you got some listening to do now. All right. So I have a few more. Uh, actually, I would like to read two, two paragraphs yeah. out of your book. Sure. And I was saying that for specific reasons before uh, if we get technical. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has to, uh, to do uh, mostly with the philosophy of, of how to practice this and how to approach this. And as I thought you said it really well. Uh, the first one that, and we talked about this briefly also, and I'm going to read it literally so I won't misquote you. That would not be good. I hope my grammar was correct. <laughs> Listen, I'm Dutch, I mean, you know, I wouldn't even notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, if you, let's see. Okay, cool. Uh, it's on page 32. It says here, you talk about the pitches, but what really struck me and what we talked about uh, a little briefly is here, practice them slowly and visualize each tricord as it is played. Now, it's a visualization that I... That I um, found very profound and very important just in general mm -hmm. and everything. Uh, and when, I, when you know, I'm teaching my class about rhythm and meter, it's, it's a lot about it. Yeah. But could you explain uh, from your point of perspective within your grammatic approach what you mean by visualization and, and what the general philosophy of it is? Well, I mean, I think that you know, all of this you know, it should be, whenever you're practicing anything, it all needs to be done in your head. Writing it out is great for when you're first trying to, to understand how it fits together. But everything ultimately has to be done inside you. Because when you're improvising, there is no piece of paper that you can rely on. So you have to, and the, and the best way to do that is, you know, when you're working on new material, whether you're dealing with, you know, chords from major scales or minor scales, or whatever, is that, you know, as you play something, you play it very slowly, you know, and relaxed as possible, and, you know, with your eyes closed, you know, in a very meditative state, and try and visualize what it is you're doing, pitch by pitch. And if it's, especially in the case of like trichords, mm -hmm. you know, or, or tetrachords. <laughs> does, does everybody know what the trichord is? Maybe you should explain a trichord that. is um, the premise of what the book is about. And right. the word trichord, is, I'm not sure who coined it, I think it might have been Milton Babbitt, but I'm not mm -hmm. positive. But the reason, though, know, in 12-tone music and in post-tonal music they use the word trichord is because they don't want to um, reference diatonic functional harmony. Because if I said triad, you would know what that means, but you would associate it with diatonic functional harmony. So in 12-tone music, because they're not dealing with functionality and traditional structures of chords and thirds, they call it trichord. And it's just much clearer. And, and as soon as you say that word, immediately you know we're talking about something that's beyond diatonicity. Right, so great, great. Yeah. But um, but anyway, you know the idea of visualizing, you know, and I, you know, if when you're working on something that's foreign to you, and you're trying to, to incorporate that and get that into your, uh, you know, physical musculature, so mm -hmm. that it becomes part of your your body, because you know we're physical beings and have to execute certain movements and train ourselves to do this in the moment, so that we're not thinking about it, and then we have to be able to actually to be able to visualize it in our mind as far as, you know, if you're playing three pitches, as you play them, what are the relationships to each other? What does it sound like? Are you, are you clear about what those are? So it's not just a physical thing you're doing. So that you understand, like, you know, I'm playing, you know, this, this is the second pitch in the tricord, this is the third pitch in the tricord, or it's in this rotation. And I'll get to what that means in a bit. Right. But, so that you're very clear about it, because it's important um, from a mul from building melodies and a melodic standpoint that you and you know are are aware of that and the more you do it, it becomes you know it's like it's like when we first learn music you know and you're taught intervals right you know and you're like well, what was a major third oh what was you know and you're going through and trying to remember what how many half steps are there? <laughs> right. you, know? And, you know I mean it's the same right. thing you know so through visualization and and you know, and hearing, and you know, it's a, it's an ear training thing too, because as you work well, on that, there we come to the next, yeah, yeah. The next one, which yeah. is another great uh, uh, quote, uh, which is um, let me see, forty-three, right here, which I thought was also very profound. And see, okay, so 
So I'm going to read this whole paragraph because I think it's very important. Uh, it says here, remember that the unifying principle of this system is the ear perceiving order to the interval content of the music. Even when played in a diatonic harmonic context, the sound of non-diatonic trichords or non-diatonic pitches in a trichord retain a structural significance and are heard as relevant in relation to their diatonic partners. It is very important to be aware that the perceived level of dissonance in these trichord combinations is affected by the melodic and rhythmic development of the musical phrase and its resolution to the cons uh, consonant pitches of the chord. But specifically the first part of that paragraph I thought was so on point. This is something you could, you could maybe uh, elaborate on that a little bit because I thought that was so important. Yeah, because I mean, you know, the thing is, is that the difference between you know, when you're listening to functional harmonic music, you know, based on, you know, uh, 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 you know, cadences and things, is that we hear, you know, we hear points of resolution, and that's what the ear mm -hmm. listens to, but in, and that's the way the music is structured, you know, right. but, but with 12-tone music, and serial music in general, the, the thing is, is that all the music is based on interval relationships, right. so intervals are all that matters, and that's how larger structures are built, and that's how compositions are, are, are arranged, do making you know the composer making determinations as as to what is the important interval in this mm -hmm. and what are how am I going to do this and so when you play um, any kind of you know trichord structures you know if we're dealing with that actually pertains strictly to the section dealing with improvising in a diatonic setting so taking these twelve tone ideas and playing them on on chord changes right. and the, the idea is that you know you hear the structure of the trichord even if there are you know uh, specifically in that instance we're talking about taking two trichords and playing them over chord changes and there will be levels of uh, depending on the combinations you use there will be levels of either greater or lesser dissonance depending on what you choose to play you can choose trichords pairs that are very consonant sounding and you probably wouldn't even know that they were derived from a 12 tone row or you can choose to play ones that are much more dissonant. And those are the ones I find more interesting because mm -hmm. they have the, the quality of bending your ear because you have a chord quality being sounded by the band, the rhythm mm -hmm. section. And then as an improviser, we're superimposing another structure over that. Right. And, and there will be the methodology, we can talk more about this as we get deeper into it, but the methodologies, there's three different methodologies that I approach in the book for using these. And there very often would be notes in the two trichords that are consonant that work functionally in, you know, on the chord, like D minor, you know, there might be an A in there, great, that works great, but maybe two other pitches are what we would traditionally call wrong notes on the chords, right? Mm -hmm. And as those two triads interact, you'll have a series of, you know, consonants and dissonants that happen. But what what the ear perceives is the structure of those two trichords mm -hmm. and their relationship to each other because, you know, it's, it's uh, because of the uh, you know interval content, and so when you're improvising, the interval content still retains its quality, even though you'll have dissonant pitches, you know, uh, being sounded against whatever those are. Right. I found that that was also one thing that you notice in the book, which I thought was so significant, that although you're dealing with all these different pitches, right, it is the form of the trichord and it's and it's whatever shape it is, that shape gives it consistency. Right, and it is the consistency that really makes it work. Exactly, because it's very much, you know, it's it's very much a melodic system. Right. Because you know, um, and it, and you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Because right. we can go to the next level, which is where we're not dealing. The whole system of this book is dealing with, you know, one trichord type and its expression within a twelve-tone row. So right. we have four of them. Right. And that's very kind of mono, you know, kind of. Uh, chromatic sound of that mm -hmm. that one thing. We right. can we can go to other levels where we're dealing with you know two different sounds. Right. But you know you have to start you know right. square yeah, sure. A before you get to the next thing. But right. but with this you know the, the thing is is that um, the beauty of it is, is that it's a very melodic system. So you're mm -hmm. playing these these melodies in, in fact you know that are that are um, it's no different than, than you know playing a different, it's smaller, it's cellular. It's like, I think of this stuff as being kind of the, the periodic table or mm -hmm. the DNA of music because, right. because you know, three note chords are the smallest kind of harmonic 
fully harmonic thing right. there is. I mean, dyads are incomplete harmonies. You know, mm -hmm. they imply something, but they're not fully functional. You know, right. but three note chords are are have a, a complexity and are, are like kind of the you know the DNA of molecular DNA of all music. Right. You know? right. So you know, it, right. Yeah, that's yeah. The, that's kind of the way I see it. Right. Know? I think also one of the benefits that also comes with this. Uh, Principle, and I've noticed that immediately when I started practicing this, is uh, I think it's specifically for horn players, or you know, it, it's the intonation factor, right? Because it really puts you on the spot in, in <laughs> right? Because <laughs> that was a lot first, of That was thing. the first yeah. thing I noticed that wow, you got to really slow it down and 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 really take that sound in slowly, mm -hmm. so. Because it's one thing, we all know to have in whole steps and, and we, we can move through it pretty fast, but to really hear it and and have the right pitch, they, they can really tell in my, you know, in my experience, in my life, it wasn't so significant. Yeah, it's it, well, you know, you end up with, when you start dealing with all the rotations, all the mm -hmm. different, you know, basically a rotation is the 12 tone uh, version of, of inversion. Right. We, we wouldn't call it inversion in 12 tone music because inversion means something but so we use the word rotation. But right. you know, when you start dealing with all the rotations, you end up with these different intervals that that very often you can kind of be you, you can cheat, you know, right. yeah, you right. can cheat, you know, and and you hear it's not right if, if right. you know you don't like you know really focus on that. I'm cheating. You know. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question yeah. because from the beginning on, uh, you're dealing with a number a, a number system that is solely uh, based upon half steps. Now, when you're not used to it, it plays tricks on you. Yeah. Because you're so used to when you see a number four, you think, oh, it's the fourth, you know. Right. Or a seven, oh, that's the seventh. Right. But now, all of a sudden, we're dealing with all the half steps. Right. Uh, just, it, you know, the, 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 the whole principle is that the, the scale is subdivided, subdivided from zero to twelve. Right? Well, to one. Or I to mean, eleven. To eleven. We don't, yeah, to 11. We don't have, yeah, because zero, zero is 11. the same as, as twelve, right? Right, exactly. So, so C is zero, and B is 11 and then everything is broken down from that and so so I found myself every now and then I said oh yeah for example with, with the, the tone rolls I said oh yeah that's a C7 flat 9 sharp 5 if I see there's two of those chords then then there you, there you go there, there it you is go. <laughs> but I, then it's funny says yeah they, they, I don't think that's really the, the idea here right well that's I mean I, I purposely avoid like talking right. in, in diatonic terms like a lot of mm -hmm. each one of these these tri-chords there's only twelve of them, which is this system is really elegant and it's very yes, simple it and it's and it's um, it's not something that I invented at all. It's something that every music theorist knows, every you know modern music theory guy knows, and they take it for granted and they're very unimpressed with it. Yes. You know, they are because there's so many more interesting things to them that you can do in from set theory. Right, and this right. is like the most boring. But for us, just to, you know, just to uh, what is set theory? Well, set theory is, is like I use that word interchangeably with post-tonal theory, whatever. Okay. But set theory is is basically all the uh, uh, the kind of functional workings of serial music, like how they organize it, the words that they use, you know, all the the, the ways of, of codifying, you know, because um, the first person, Alan Fort, was a great music theorist who basically wrote the first book on set theory dealing mm -hmm. with every possible note combination that you can have. And he, they, he sat down and I think he was a, he, well he's obviously a math guy, right. Right. So, right. but he basically they've codified every possible combination of pitch and they've categorized it as according to its interval content and um, you know they've classified it and named it. They have uh, also been able to classify each one of these according mm -hmm. to its uh, relationship to other groups of pitches, its complements, and what are the relationships between them, and, mm -hmm. and you know all these. There's tons of parameters that they use to find significant relationships or, or ways of playing off of different combinations of sets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's it can it's very it's huge. It's a very big field, and wow. it's very complicated. But you know, and so for us. You know, as improvisers, we need a system that is um, in, we can internalize. You know, something that that is useful. That's like kind of basically a system of harmony, because it's a, that way we have something to be drawn. You know, right. and the, to have like every note combination possible is totally useless to us. Right. Unless, of course, you're composing, and then you can sit down. You know, do that. Yeah. But so the tricord 
sets, which are you know the three note sets that all these theorists have like written about and everybody all of them know about, is the one that's that's you know has the fewest possibilities and has the most most possibilities mm -hmm. because you know as we look at those this world unfolds that you know we can look at each one of these rows and each one of these trichords has relationships to chords that we know right. you know um, because you know you have um, some of the trichords are like minors or, or dominant seventh chords without a third or you know minor seven chords without a fifth mm -hmm. or they're like you know like uh, you know major seven chords without a fifth or a major seven chord without a third but you don't you know, in the book, I don't call them that, and I don't even right. reference that right. because number one, you should see that that's what it is, right. and number two, we want to deal with what it is because right. we're we're thinking in terms of, you know, not labeling it according to, according to what we're used to, right. and I think it's important to look at it as just the object that it is because it's useful in a lot of ways. It opens your mind to other possibilities. Right. Yeah. Oh, this is a great introduction. I just want to tell you that that. Um, um, the book is, is very significant. You know, obviously that's the reason why uh, John is here, that's why we're talking about it. One thing that I can tell you is that uh, apart from uh, that these concepts are being addressed in the book, uh, it gives a very clear guideline in how to start, where to start, what to do, how to set yourself up and how to get ready to the next phase. This is not so much, in my opinion, not so much a book where you can just pick a topic somewhere in the middle of the book and just go and just go for it. I think it's really worth your while to start from the beginning, read the introduction, the first five chapters, so you get familiarity with, with the, the, the definitions and with the principle involved, uh, which is ingenious. I thought uh, also how you, how you group certain intervals into the smallest uh, uh, movements and all that kind of stuff is really great. So. Uh, also, it has music samples, so you can actually immediately try it with a with, with, uh, with CD. So I highly recommend you uh, to get the book and get to work. Uh, we're going to take now a short little break, and then uh, John is going uh, to talk more in detail about the concepts and also give us a, 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 a little taste of it. A showcase. Yeah. Yeah.